be like, it'd be a beautiful sunny day. And I'd be like, oh, there's a bunch of people going to the beach, uh, like tons of girls, people, someone's got beer ball, like it's going to be sick. And they'd be like, uh, no, we're stay in the basement, practice a little bit. And I'd be like, you guys are fucking nuts. Welcome, everyone, to This Was The Scene, the podcast that takes a look back at the late 90s, early 2000s punk scene. I am your host, Mike Doyle. A Wilhelm Scream is a melodic hardcore band from New Bedford, New Bedford, Massachusetts, formed in 1999. Many people have referenced Strung Out, Hot Water Music, Propagandi, and Strike Anywhere as the band's similar artists. Their name is a reference to the Wilhelm Scream, a famous stock sound effect which is mainly used in films. Oh, that's what that is. I didn't know that. Th- I actually didn't know what that thing was called. <laughs> band previously went by names Cone, Keon. I don't know how to say that. Adams Crack and Smack and Isaiah, which is uh, the band that I knew. Though the last was the only name to be used in any major releases. The reason for the name change was Cohen. Shit, he says this in the interview too, and I forget to say it. The reason for the name changes from Cohen to Smack and Isaiah, then to a Wilhelm scream, was really a matter of them adding new members and progressing, maturing as a band. So my old band, Lane Meyer, used to go to New Bedford all the time, and Russ from All About Records used to put on shows up there, and I don't know how we got in contact with him. I'm sure it was Sean, who's the drummer for Lane Meyer, he because he booked everything we did. Russ would put on these shows at this like Alcoholics Anonymous Center, and on one half of the building were people going to AA meetings, and the other was just this punk rock show that would happen. And uh, it was it just interesting. I talked about it a few times. Even in Jay Vick's interview, I talked about it, and I forget the... I, I don't know. I forget all the other ones. But when we would go there and play, Smack and Isaiah was always the headliner to those shows, and that's how we got to meet these guys. And uh, I mentioned, I think it was like Steve LWL's episode which was like, I think, number five or nine, something like that. Uh, I talk about the story where we all went and partied afterwards and like burned up Christmas trees on a beach, and then I made some comment to their bassist girlfriend at the time <laughs> where she had some tattoo, and I was... I think I made some joke or something. It's It was really innocent. It wasn't like, um, it wasn't bad. So yeah, so I've talked about this plenty of times, and uh, I thought it'd be a great idea to rekindle the the olden days with uh with nuno so i hit him up on instagram or as i call it the gram and uh, asked him to chat and he said yes yes michael i would i would like to do that and this is what we chatted about his love of hockey sean lane will probably love that part playing fest his love of musicals <laughs> why mondays are always his day off all about records transitioning to a wilhelm scream rob dobby doing their artwork Nitro Records, Keeping in Touch with Past Members, Lynn, Massachusetts, and a ton more. Now, here's a couple things before I jump into this. I just want to give, uh, I don't have any sponsors this week, so I guess I'll sponsor myself. There's two other things that I do besides this podcast. One, I have a comic on Instagram called Daily Bread, but the handle is Your Daily Bread, and I have a new sketchbook coming out called Draw Some Richards, a sketchbook for people who like to draw, dot, 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 you get the idea. I had this other book called Drink and Draw, a sketchbook for single people sitting at bars, and I put them all around Raleigh, and there's a couple in New York State. It's a sketchbook where I give prompts, like draw a unicorn or draw a wombat. I used Anthony Noyance's draw wombat reference, and it's just a bunch of stuff. So the whole idea is to get people off their phone at a bar and just draw, because that's what I do when I go. I sit by myself and I just like pull out my pens and draw things. So what I saw when I go went around and checked out all these books is that people really love drawing dicks. So I was like, let me just give the people what they want. And that's where this book has come about. So this book will be available in November. So keep checking back uh, at my Instagram account. I'll probably also talk about it again on here. And I'll have it on the thiswasthescene.com website. I'm guessing that this will be a good gift for people to just keep in their apartment or give to grandma. Or um, someone mentioned bachelorette parties or bachelor parties just because that's what you want to do when you're drinking. Just sit around and just draw dicks. So some of the prompts are like, draw a Richard on a boat, draw a Richard on a unicorn, draw a Richard in church, draw a Richard doing black tar heroin. Yes, these are all real, so go check it out. Also, I'm a freelance graphic designer and animator and video editor. Uh, that's what I do for a living. I've done that since 2006. So if you're a marketing agency and have a little bit of overflow and you want to hire me out, uh, I could do freelance work. 
And if you are a company looking to explain what your company does, then I also do explainer animations. I also do logo animations. I just did some display for a bank in Texas that just runs in a loop behind them. Kind of like when you go to a movie theater and you see the screens behind a concession stand, and there's just some like, looping graphics that display like what their products and services are. So I could do all that stuff. So if you want to check that out, go to drive80.com, D-R-I-V-E 80.com, and you can check out my work there. I also just launched this product where I'm doing stock animations where you could sign up and uh, I have them on my website. You just go to stock animations on it. You know, if you're at driveaday.com on the top right menu bar, just hit stock animations. I'm selling stock videos that are between five to 20 bucks. If you'd like to sponsor the show, just email this was a scene at gmail.com and you could be in the show intro like now. You could be in the teasers that I post on Instagram each week or it could be a banner on the website. Just email again, this was the scene at gmail.com. Thank you again, all the Patreon supporters and the constant support from everyone who has donated from to the podcast. If you want to support, uh, Patreon's a dollar a month. And what you get is all these episodes, uh, which everyone else gets, but you're helping the cause. And it, it does add up because there are costs to this. Like I said, I work for myself, and which I've said in many intros and blah, 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 but it helps keep the lights on. So yeah, great. Feel free to subscribe, leave a review, or share this with anyone who loves some punk rock nostalgia, and you can share it by hitting the share button in the app you're listening to this podcast in, and it'll prompt you to either email or text someone and just text someone or email them and say, Yo, you should listen to this because this is cool. And yeah, with that said, let's get started. What's up, brother? Uh, just same old shit. Uh, just finished cleaning the house. Uh, now I'm going to go fishing for a couple hours before I have to pick my kid up at school. There you go. I see that you're quite into hockey. Yeah, I do. I love, I love hockey. I mean, uh, growing up, I didn't have enough money to play it. You know what I mean? But uh, the Bruins were always on TV, like, and, you know, Massachusetts and in this whole area is kind of like, you know, was very, very hockey centric in like the mid late eighties when I was growing up and stuff. So I was always surrounded by it. And then, um, had friends who played it, but I, I was not dragging my ass out of bed at like five o'clock in the morning to go play hockey in high school. You know what I mean? That just, that just seemed to asinine, you know, I'd rather stay out till 1130 skateboarding, but, um, but yeah, as I got older, I kind of, you know, got like a, you know, I just like, Hey man, I, I want to go try this hockey thing out. You're like, as I get older, I realize that my joints are getting worse, so I'm going to try hockey <laughs> well, you know, out. You know what's actually pretty funny? So I've had like two ACL reconstructions, right, because of skateboarding and sports and stuff like that. But uh, uh, oddly enough, oddly enough, being a nice hockey goalie, you would think it would be terrible for your knees. But uh, I've actually I've, I've only gotten hurt like maybe once playing playing ho- ice hockey, you know what I mean? Oh, really? As opposed to skateboarding where it's like, dude, 30 minutes of skateboarding at, at my age now, and I'm like wrecked, dude. Oh, I bet. Yeah. Did you and Sean ever talk about hockey? Sean from Lanemeyer? Because he's been huge in hockey forever. No kidding. No, nah, probably. I mean, maybe in passing, maybe like, you know, but I don't I don't remember really getting into it, really, I, like I, talking about it. I feel like he would have geeked the fuck out. He's been like a Rangers fan forever. And... Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, Rangers are a great team. Rangers are a great team. <laughs> um, yeah, dude. So are you still in, uh, are you still in New Bedford? I am, yeah. As a matter of fact, yeah, I'm right in downtown New Bedford as we speak. Oh no, shit! You guys still have the uh, the what was it? Every time we would go to play a show, there was reflections. Always, well, the reflections, which we're definitely gonna talk about, but yeah. there was the McDonald's sign as we drove up, and there was always like a lobster roll that we were always so intrigued by as we were driving down. What road is that? to get down there 495 no one uh 95 or 195 195 yeah. was the one we took down there yeah but yeah man so um i started this podcast about a year and a half ago just talking about the late 90s scene and uh it's been doing pretty well and i'm just that's right yeah and it's um just the whole focus is late 90s early 2000 and um and i was like i got it because it started in new jersey and then i was branching out to all the bands that influenced us or just me remembering bands that we played with. And uh, I was like, fuck, dude, I got to talk to you about like Smack and Isaiah and then have that kind of transition into Wilhelm Scream and talk about that a little bit. But uh, yeah, so it's like the whole structure is it's really just going back to very beginning where you got into music, how it led to punk rock, talk about um, Smack and Isaiah and then talk about the transition into, you know, you finding the scene up there, talk about like the, what New Bedford scene was like and new reflections and, and all that shit. But um, I guess, yeah, I'm guessing you've probably done a shit ton of interviews since uh, Wilhelm Scream. 
I've done it. I've done a fair amount. Yeah. yeah. I don't mind doing it. I like doing interviews. I like chit chatting and kind of finding out where the interview is coming from and, you know, kind of, you know, different, different interviews put you in front of a different audience. You know what I mean? So, yeah. Although they're all kind of under the umbrella of music or, or what have you, for the most part, it's still, it's still like a good way to kind of reach out and kind of, you know, tell your story to maybe a group of people who haven't quite heard it yet, or maybe are just finding you for the first time, if that's even still a thing anymore for us. But yeah, I mean, you guys are, are you guys playing, uh, that's how you guys are playing a bunch of shows coming yeah, up. Yeah, we have, uh, like Gainesville Fest coming up. We have, uh, wow. we have, uh, the, uh, Blasting Room 25th anniversary show out in Colorado coming up. Jesus. Uh, and then we have, uh, we have, a, a, a couple dates like here in New Bedford, like right after Christmas. That's awesome. Do you guys still yeah. have like a pretty big following in New Bedford? Oh, without a doubt. Yeah, man. Like, uh, I think dude, the last show we played at this venue, like we sold it out in like, it was like 300, it's like a 300 cap room or so. Uh, and we sold it out in like 16 hours or something like that. That's awesome. It was like less than a day, like faster than, uh, faster than, uh, what's his name? Ace Freely. <laughs> like, hell yeah. The other dude was like, dude, you just outsold this place faster than Ace Freely did. And I'm like, who's Ace Freely, bro? Fuck out of here. They have to like prop Bedford. him. They have to like prop him up on stage. <laughs> yeah. I think my buddy saw Frankie Valley. He saw him in Morristown, New Jersey a few years ago. And he just had so many backup singers that they basically almost like, they said they literally had to have him like propped up to stand there. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. everyone else was singing. And they're like, they're like, we just want to see him. And he's like, not even, I don't think he was even singing. And you know what, too, like probably like Frankie Valley is one of those dudes, dude, like, you know, who knows how much money he made and how much like management and all these other people and record labels took from him. So like it, it's oh, yeah. painful. It pains me to think that this guy at his age might still need to climb up on stage just to make sure he can get like his freaking respirator paid for or whatever. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, you think about it, like when we all started off, I was thinking about that. Now it's the band. I think I've talked about this a few times. It's the bands who are still touring all the time and they may they still have this as a job and. Like, I hope that a majority of them still love it. Like, Listen Jake still tours and plays big shows. But, you know, it's like when we all started, we all wanted that. But as we got older, I think a lot of them were like, shit, we're still doing this? Like, we're still have to do this all the time? I think it's it's pretty easy to get disenfranchised, you know what I mean? Especially if you're like, you know, like a, a C-list band, you know what I mean? Like, it's it's difficult. But, I mean, I, I, I never thought it would be easy. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. no one ever said it was going to be easy. I mean as kids going to shows like you know when we would go see you know at our local venue like bigger venues you know drive to providence or boston to see these bands yeah man like it was they were they were living it and like they they had buses they had roadies they had meals they had you know what i mean meals. like they had it they had it money. all like they had yeah meals money and and like in and everything you know gear like and you aspire to that certainly um but I suppose, like as the grind goes on, you see that that kind of level of success is 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 it's not unattainable, but it's certainly difficult to get there. Um, it kind of puts off a lot of people. But I we never we never saw that as the as the as the mean like you know we never saw that as the goal. Like we just we just wanted to play. We just love playing our music. So you know if if you get popular, you get put in bigger venues, you get roadies, you get whatever. That's that's all that's all gravy. You know what I mean? But yeah. I mean, the fact that we can still go out there and 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 do what we love to do for 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 a crowd every night is 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 pretty outstanding, in in my opinion. You know? Yeah, and the fact that you guys get to play fast too, that seems like a pinnacle. Play. Fest is great. Yeah, yeah, we're like we're like the perennial fest band at this point now. Though it's we took a couple. I think we took like two years off in the last ten or something. It's like it's going to be one of those things where you just kind of count on it. Like you don't make plans for that weekend because you know at some point Tony's going to call you up and be like, hey. <laughs> you, you, guys, you guys want to do this thing again how is that set up anyway is it set up where it's all around town or is it just one correct venue? okay yeah correct so they'll have like a number like you know a dozen or more venues you know what i mean all varying sizes and, and capacities or whatever um they used to have like the main stage was uh used to be indoors but now it's outdoors at bo diddley plaza there in gainesville yeah um it's a pretty sweet setup man like it's it's just pretty wild to see a town just get completely inundated with you know, punk rockers and, and, you know, wrestlers and, you know, everybody, like, you know, all, all different fringe types, you know what I mean? Yeah, we have a thing uh, called, I mean, I live in Raleigh, North Carolina now, and we have this thing called uh, Hopscotch. It's all just different types of music. Like, a couple years ago, like, Sylvan F's, Sylvan S.O. played and Flaming Lips, and then, then uh, but there'll be these free shows, like, all 
all day long from one to five. You can walk into all these bars and drink and watch. And then you got to, then there's people with tickets. They go into see like the bigger shows, but it's from like Thursday to Saturday. It's just music from one o'clock until like one in the morning. It's fucking awesome. Yeah, it's great. It's a great way to like get, you know, bands from, and like people from all over the world come out to the best. You know what I mean? Like oh, yeah. people from Japan, Australia, you know, all over Europe south africa like people i've met people from literally the four corners of the world at that place so yeah i feel like it's like the it's like the craft the craft beer punk rock scene pretty much yeah it's uh, like it brings people out man i try to keep this oh i mean i try to keep it to an hour but uh, i mean it is like a, a monday so <laughs> i'm not gonna let it go too long but i want to go back to when you were a young kid and just like talk about what was the first thing you heard that triggered you to go oh my god i love music oh god dude sheesh uh so i'm an old fart i was born in 79 Mm -hmm. um like my family my family immigrated from portugal in the mid 70s and then my sister and i were born here uh our family got our first house in about 1984 i think it was 83 or 84 and it was just about that time that mtv came out yeah and uh I remember just, I was a latchkey kid, you know what I mean? Everyone was working, so I'd come home from school and just, like, plant myself in front of the television. And uh, I remember seeing, like, um, like, like Bruce Springsteen videos and stuff like that, like the Dancing in the Dark video and stuff. And being like, wow, this guy, like, you know, look at this band, look at this crowd, like, everyone's so hyped. And then, like, of course, like, in the 80s, like, mid-80s, there was, like, the huge mega stars were out, you know, your Madonna's, your Michael Jackson's, um, journey, like all the metal hair bands too. Like, but, uh, I had a lot of, I had access to a lot of records, my uncle's records and my mom's record collection. So I was listening to everything, dude, like pop, you know, top 10 music, uh, folk music, <laughs> like, uh, you know, it's, Bruce Springsteen was a big part of it for sure. Like seeing him do his thing, like, he was like the essence of rock and roll to me, like as a kid. Um, well, since you were, you know, you ended up being a front man. Was there something about that as a, like when you were young, when you were younger and you saw Bruce Springsteen, it was it kind of in, embedded in your mind. Like, oh man, like I want to play music and I want to be in front of the stage. I want to have that interaction for sure. Like, you know what I mean? Like I'm, I, I played like the only instrument I ever played to any success level of success was the cello. So I wasn't going to be like rocking and rolling with a cello. You know what I mean? <laughs> I couldn't really play guitar too well. I, I played bass a little bit, but I was like, ah, you know what? Um, I, I enjoy being in, in people's faces. You know what I mean? I like being right up front. I mean, even going to shows, that was a thing. You know what I mean? Like I wanted to be right in front, you know, singing along with with you know whatever band i was watching so so how did you get involved in like the punk scene like how did you how old were you when you started listening uh, to like punk? Geez. that would have been like probably about the time i discovered skateboarding so like the early 90s 91 92 uh i got like my first skateboard i think in 92 but i had been watching skate videos and stuff and hearing like you know bad religion songs on on skate videos or you know black flag songs and or JFA and all these like, you know, punk bands. And, uh, it just, it went with the, it went with the skateboarding so well, you know what I mean? It was raw, it was energetic. It was, you know, a little bit destructive, like, and it was just the perfect soundtrack, you know what I mean? And so, uh, at the end of the videos, uh, I would, you know, wait for the credits and be like, Oh, what song was that? That dude skated to. And it would say, you know, you know, anesthesia by bad religion or something, you know what I mean? Like, and I would, I would write that down. Um, other, another thing I would do, cause we didn't have any money was I would just make like mixtapes, but essentially I would just, uh, audio tape the, the sound off. <laughs> like, so like, it'd be all these great songs, like, but with like a ton of skateboarding noise in the, <laughs> in the background. Wait, uh, what was this? So like, I would, I would take like a little tape, ca- like cassette recorder yeah. and I would hold it up to the TV, <laughs> uh, and record like the songs off the video, That's amazing. but it would have all the, all, it would have all the skateboarding sounds in the background too, you know? <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, that, I think skateboarding was really what got me into punk rock. Yeah. You know, at that point, like I was, I was pretty into metal, like, you know, Metallica had been out for a couple of years, like for a couple of years. Um, so, you know, Master of Puppets was like one of my favorite records at that time. Uh, I kind of got made fun of a little bit cause like, you know, back then you were either, you were, you had to be, you were, you know, pigeonholed, you know, you were either, you know, a headbanger, 
you know, a goth or a jock or, you know, typical 80s bullshit. But, yeah. Um, but I was like, I'd like, uh, you know, listen to a cross section of different shit. I was listening to, you know, Boogie Down Productions, you know, like KRS-One, Metallica and Black Flag. You know what I mean? Like, I just kind of liked it. it. Whatever I liked, I liked. Was that but, your typical um, thing? That Like, how old were you when you started skateboarding? I was probably about 12, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Was that your, basically your, your act, your go-to activity? Yeah, no doubt. Like my, I quit playing baseball. Like my friends like, dude, you're going to go to baseball practice. That's so lame, bro. Like let's go skate. And I was like, yeah, you know what? Fuck it. Let's go skate. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) So I quit, quit baseball after like, and I played baseball for like eight years, dude. I was like pretty invested in baseball, but, uh. Uh, I stopped growing and everyone kept growing and uh, <laughs> it just quickly became a lot more difficult once you started hitting the kids started hitting puberty hard. But uh, yeah, I got into that. And ap- I mean, after that, it was just full on skateboarding nonstop. You know what I mean? So like, again, like I would just, you know, whatever was in a skate video, whatever song was playing, whether it was the Pixies or whatever, like that was the band I was into. You know what I mean? Like I got all almost everything like. And then, of course, you start meeting people through that, through those channels who introduce you to other bands. Um, when I was 14 or so, no, how old was I? Sheesh. Uh, how old are you in like seventh grade, eighth grade? Uh, well, I was always, because I, I was 79 too, so I think I'd always, at, what was it, 13? I, was, I turned 13 in eighth grade? I think. Yeah, I think I was turning 14 in ninth grade. After seventh grade, uh, my family and I packed up and moved to Japan for a few years. Oh, wow. And uh, so when I got there, um, you know, uh, it was it was it's pretty interesting. Like you're in a completely you're on the other side of the planet. Essentially, you don't really know anybody, but you've got two things. You know what I mean? You've got your skateboard and your music. You know what I mean? And so you kind of seek out back then. It was easy. Nowadays, everyone's wearing bands and, and skate shoes and stuff. But back then you just kind of walk the halls looking for like a dead Kennedy's patch or like yeah. a, a pair of like airwalks that were beat up or something. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, the and, and you would be like, all right, dude, I don't know anything about you, but we're apparently we're friends now. You know? <laughs> um, but yeah, moving over there was pretty cool. I got, you know, cause again, like we lived on a military base, even though we weren't military. Um, but I got to meet kids from all over the States and stuff like that. And, you know, they'd introduce me to like, you know, different bands and whatnot. And we'd share, you know, you know, knowledge of, of bands that we liked at that point grunge and like the whole sub pop thing was going off so yeah. like you know uh bands like gray matter obviously nirvana like and like all these other bands were like heavy on the playlist but uh i had a friend he was an airman he was 21 years old he's very young dude looking back on it now you know uh he was a russian linguist he was essentially like a spy <laughs> like he uh, would fly in those awax planes with the big discs on top and like intercept you know messages or whatever and he would <laughs> translate them um but he was from uh, the East Bay. And so he's like, oh, like, I see, like, oh, you like Operation Ivy. You like this, that. He's like, oh, you should check out this new band these guys are doing. They're called Rancid. He had, like, a demo, like, Rancid's first, like, demo. Like, and That's we would, awesome. like, listen to that all the time. And uh, he introduced me to Jawbreaker, Monsula, 15, like, a lot of, like, uh, like, you know, well, Jawbreaker's not. But, like, you know, East Bay bands, you know what I'm saying? Like, Green Day was just about to, like go huge so like listen to a lot of that stuff but it was really like a a great way to to kind of expand your musical horizons just kind of moving around and meeting new people who who obviously have similar interests but maybe know a little bit more or or have discovered bands before you and introduce you to them it was it was a really really fun fun time for me for sure i mean to this day i stuck pretty much it like set almost in stone like the type of music i listen to like when I'm driving to go fishing later, I'll probably be listening to one of those seven bands I just listed. You know what I'm saying? Like, uh, but uh, it was cool. I mean, again, the world is a little bit smaller of a place. There was this is you know pre big internet days and stuff like that. So, again, you would you know you you buy a record and then you'd go into the bands like thank you list and find out which bands they thanked and you'd go check out to see if your local store had any of those you know cds or tapes on hand i always talk about that for other interviews it's so everyone just knew to do that it's kind of like how i've said so so many times of how you always knew to blew and blow into your nintendo cartridge right yeah or just like how you everyone learned all the codes somehow (laughs) right there was no internet to learn this shit yeah everyone just kind of figured the shit out so, so was there like when you, so you're in Japan and when did you come back to the states? How old uh, were you? So I was I was in Japan. So I moved there in I was there uh, from eighth grade. I lived in Okinawa for four years, uh, about f- almost four years, 
And then I lived in Tokyo for the last year. Wow. Um, and then I moved back and, uh, I moved back just at the end, I think of like very, like the last month or so of my, uh, would have been my sophomore year in high school. Um, obviously I had friends. I used to come home every summer and my buddies that I grew up with and skateboarded with, you know, they'd introduce me to new friends they had made and we'd all, you know, through skateboarding and music and whatnot. And, uh, came back into high school and I had, uh, I was walking through the hall one day, uh, and I noticed this kid had a screeching weasel patch, like on his backpack or something. And I go, Hey, like you're into screeching weasel. And he's like, you know what this is? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, yeah, man, uh, that, that kid was, uh, you know, uh, now like, you know, one of my best friends, you know, a uh, longtime friend, Craig Olson. And he was like, oh, dude, I got to introduce you to like a bunch of my friends. <laughs> you know what I mean? It was still kind of like on that level. Yeah. Uh, and he was like, hey, like you, you like punk and all this stuff. He's like, you want to be in a band? And I was all, yeah, of course I do. <laughs> and uh, so he invited me to go jam with like a bunch of dudes that he was like, had like a little, you know, like, you know side project you know fun time kind of a band thing going on they didn't really play shows but they would write songs and jam in the basement and uh that's when i met like trevor like yep. that's how i met trevor riley that's how i met nick angelini uh john tevs john cavallo like all the original smack and isaiah members and stuff like that um was just like through one of those random you know mid 90s like hey what you know that you know what this is like we share similar interests we're best friends now kind of a kind of a thing went down you know so and so, here we are today, you know. I know it's crazy. Not, not to like, not to like, quickly like go gloss over everything else, but You're like, literally, and like, we're it was, done. <laughs> it was it was like you know it was a quick conversation, and you know, Gold House, which is like uh, you know one of the houses in New Bedford High School, like Gold House, like walkway, you know, like you like Screech and Weasel, I like Screech and Weasel. Uh, you want to be in a band? Sure, boom, and that was it, dude. Were, was there an actual scene going on? Because this is all New Bedford at this point. Oh, New Bedford had had a massive scene going for years and years and years. Um, there's always been like a lot of like musicians. Um, there's a really famous R&B group, the Tavares, who came out of New Bedford. Um, uh, but I mean, more so like on like what would have kind of given us kind of life was the, like the, you know, the early hardcore uh, scene that was in and around New Bedford, uh, you know, throughout the 80s and, and 90s and stuff like that. Uh, that that kind of paved the way for like, you know, um, more like independent bands, I guess you call it like whether it was new wave or punk rock or, you know, what kids call emo now, like, you know, like it, it, it ushered in like, you know, or at least laid the foundation, uh, you know, for bands like that to take off or at least have like venues to play at. Um, there used to be like a three day fest in New Bedford, Massachusetts, uh, was you that, know, Lifetime would come through. Okay. Uh, was that New Bedford Fest? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Didn't Russ so that, always? Wait, did Russ take that over, or did he? Russ, did Russ, he Russ took it over. Yeah, and like the last, I think the last two kind of, um, the last two New Bedford Fests, I think, were Russ. But uh, okay. prior to that, I mean, like, uh, oh gosh, Ken, Kendra Leaks, maybe I can't remember her last name now, but I know, um, I know the girl Kendra. She, she would like. Yeah, you know, she was, uh, you know, one of the forerunners, like in, in getting that started in the '90s and bringing in like bigger acts. You know what I mean? Like I said, like bands like Lifetime, oh, uh, Texas is the reason. Uh, yeah, she's oh, like uh, Joyce. I mean, just like I mean, everyone came through and played it. Uh, you know, Cloak and Dagger or Ink and Dagger, Ink rather. And Dagger. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, uh, like just a ton, a ton of like hardcore and punk bands have come through, and it was it was pretty rad. Like. Those were the days where you know you can go buy like a dialer off of somebody's merch table. Remember dialers? Wait, were those the ones? I've had this. Some people have talked about this, where you'd go to a payphone and yeah, and they would okay. make the noise of the coins dropping in. Wait, and they would like call for free. The bands would sell those. Yeah, because that's how bands on tour would be able to like call venues. This is like no one had cell phones. Yet. Oh yeah. So like, if you had a dialer, you could just be like, oh dude, pull over. I'm gonna like call my mom or like whatever, and you could like you know use the dialer to call whoever you needed to. And that would really come in huge. That was huge when you're on tour, right? That's genius that they were selling them, though. Yeah, you could get them. They were totally, like, completely, totally, utterly illegal. Like, probably on, like, a federal level. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> but, I mean, but, yeah, it was, uh, but, yeah, dude, it was, you know, uh, it was shit like that. You'd get zines. You'd get, like, you know, yeah. someone would obviously have, like, you know, Book Your Own Fucking Life, which was, like, the maximum rock and roll 
uh, like like phone book essentially, right? Yep. Where you would look like you could build, you could book a whole tour, and we did several times uh, using just this book. Uh, it just had contact listings for like all the clubs, promoters, people who put bands up at their house. Like it was it was huge. So like you you could grab one of those at the fest, and you, then your band you get one of those in a dialer, dude. You're halfway there. You know, yeah, pretty mean? much. That you need a van and <laughs> dude, some, you're good uh, to go. Combo yeah. amp. <laughs> exactly. Just pilots. Uh, no, nah, just borrow the local O's shit, dude. You're good to go. <laughs> I've had so many people like um, like Vinny from Less Than Jake. Like he yeah. even talked about book your own fucking life. I think. Everyone I've talked to, there you go. We found bands through the thank you list. We were skating, and someone brought a boombox, and Seven Seconds was playing on it. And then they're like, then we came out a band, and we found Maximum Rock and Roll, Book Your Own Fucking Life. It's like how everybody was doing it back then. Yeah, it was it was pretty organic, you know what I mean? Like I said, like you didn't have access to all the all the cool shit we have now. You know, what I mean that kind of that kind of exploded, really. I mean, yeah. it seemed like almost overnight. You know what I mean? You went from you know, you know, from printing out like, you know, a Chinese phone book worth of like map quest directions, you know what I mean? To like feel like, yo, who's, whose phone can I use? So then how, so smacking, so the, but was it Trevor who said you want to start a band and you're like, fuck yeah. Uh, it was, uh, my buddy Craig who introduced me to like Trevor and all those guys. He brought yeah. me into trip. So he's like, Hey, let, like I'll pick you up after school and we'll drive out to Sasquin to my buddy's house and like try out or whatever, you know? Okay. So, um, so Craig Olson picks me up and we drive over to Sasquin, which is like the way deep North end of New Bedford. It's like, um, where Trevor and John Tevs and everybody and those guys all grew up, Nick Angelini. And so that, it brought me into Trevor Riley's basement for the first time. And, uh, so down there at the time, it was like me, that kid, Craig, uh, Trevor, uh, Trevor Riley, John Cavallo, uh, I think Tez was there, but he wasn't in that band. They had like four bands going, I think, or something like that. Okay. He might have just been hanging out. Uh, and then there was, uh, oh, what the heck was his name? Oh, I feel like such a dick. Uh, not, what the heck was his name? So I have the Wikipedia Andy. up here, and it's got everybody, in the, it's got the whole timeline. So. <laughs> yeah, dude, I don't know. This is like, this might be, this might predate that, though. Oh, um, yeah, because this starts in 96. Yeah, so this would have been like this. Yeah, this would have been like probably like '95 or something like that when I first, first like you know, that summer when I first met those dudes. Uh, but we had a kid who's like um, he ended up being the valedictorian of our <laughs> of our graduating class, okay. and uh, he actually snuck in a couple like uh, you know when he was doing his valedictorian speech. Yeah, he yeah. like he snuck in a couple like band like you know song titles and like uh, awesome. you know band names and stuff like that. Anyway, uh, that's awesome. He was uh, he was a good kid, uh, but they were all hanging out in the basement, and I went down there, and they played a couple of the songs that they were working on. Uh, they were all kind of goofy, stupid songs, but uh, but you could tell that they were having fun. And then uh, then the other band that they were in had practice, and they were like an established band. I, I think that was Adam's Crack back then. That was like Trevor and John Tevs and and John Cavallo. Um, they had already played some shows around New Bedford, and. Um, they had just lost their singer. Their singer quit. And I can't remember why Adrian quit, but he quit. <laughs> and they needed a singer. Uh, but they were also looking to write some new t- some new tunes. So uh, they just kind of abandoned Adam's crack. And that's pretty much how uh, Smack and Isaiah became a thing. Did you had you been had you ever sung prior to this, or like uh, like even on your own, or to like listening to CDs because not not to toot my own horn, but I was already an established thespian of the stage. Uh, at, uh, at that point, I had done a bunch of like, um, like, uh, like theater. Oh, OK. Or, or whatever. Uh, I done, Yeah, I had done a ton of theater uh, while living overseas and stuff like that throughout like middle school and high school. Um, so I, I, I didn't have any aversions to being up on stage, you know, and in front of people. I, I'd rather I kind of liked it. You know what I mean? OK, so you, I didn't realize that you already had all these uh, these chops all uh, established. I I'd also like like uh, started kind of like right before I left Tokyo, me and a couple of kids from school had started like a band. We played, you know, three or four originals and like three or four covers. You know what I mean? Like face to face songs and shit like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so we had played a couple of shows, uh, but then, then I, of course, I moved away, you know, so that was the end of that. Uh, 
but uh yeah while i was uh while i was overseas i i you know i, I got a lot of work in in regards to like being up on stage singing uh which i hate to this day i still fucking can't stay in musical theater oh really it's like the, it's like the lowest form of entertainment in my opinion <laughs> uh, i'm not even kidding i'd rather mime than do musicals uh <laughs> <laughs> I have more respect for him. I just, I just can't do musicals, bro. I hate it. Interesting. Uh, yeah, I know. I can't stand him, dude. Uh, <laughs> this guy is not uh, a fan of um, what's that play that's so huge right now? Uh, Hamil- ha- ha- Hamilton. 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 Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, you know what? It's probably a fucking awesome play. Just shut the fuck up and talk about like, just you know, like, oh god, I hate it. Like, <laughs> don't, don't sing to me what's going on. Just do your job as an actor and act it the fuck out, dum dum. Like. Oh God, what am I six years old? Like, Oh, I hate it. I bet you. And like, the thing is, I bet you it's fucking awesome. You know what I mean? It's probably incredible, but no, nah, I can't. As soon as you start singing and dancing out, like what's going on? Like, Nope. I feel I'm like out. your, I feel like your hell would be like, your hell would be watching cats. I remember you guys were like instrumentally. The one thing that stood out to me, I mean, Trevor like shredded on fucking guitar and uh, like from the beginning. So were they always, did they start off all of the guys like being that good instrumentally or did that come in? No, I think we practiced a ton. You know what I mean? We'd get, we'd go, you know, what's funny. You know, I have today off Monday off because Mondays ever since like junior year in high school were practice days. So I I would never like wherever I had a job or wherever I'd be like, hey, I can't work Mondays. You know what I mean? That's funny. So to this day, at 40 years old, I still have Mondays off. You know what I mean? Because of (laughs) because of Monday practice. What do you do real quick? What do you do now real quick? Oh, for work? Yeah, Uh, I work. uh, I work front of house and do like uh, like um, like money deposits and stuff like that for my buddy's taco shop here in New Bedford. No problem. Uh, okay, I was gonna say it was like it's pretty it's pretty amazing that you can just show up at a job and be like, hey, by the way, uh, <laughs> Monday I don't work. I'm not here, dude. They're no. like, okay. <laughs> we haven't okay. practiced on Mondays in like 15 years, dude. <laughs> I'm still taking Mondays off. You still got the uh, habit. So you would, so you guys would just, just in case, you know what I mean? Just in case someone <laughs> Trevor calls up and he's like, Hey man, you want to jam? Like, Hell yeah, dude, it's Monday. Let's do this. You're like, I've been prepared uh, for 15 years. Yeah. Dude. We would go to Trevor's house, uh, you know, and practice in his basement for six hours straight. You know what I mean? Like, like at least once a week. So, um, like in doing so, I think we, we got our chops together and we got yeah. tight playing together. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and I think that really helped us out in the early, early going, like early stages, because there were a lot of bands, but you could tell a lot of them were kind of shitty, like they didn't practice or they didn't, you know, they were, they weren't tight, you know what I mean? Like yeah, you guys are always really fucking tight. And then we'd show up, you know, a bunch of kids and like, you know, blow like all these bands out of the water. Like bands would be like, oh fuck, we have to go on after these fucking kids. Like Jesus Christ. And I'd take that as like a huge, you know, compliment. <laughs> like, yeah, absolutely. yeah, my guys, my guys rip, dude. They rock like Trevor and like, it'd be a beautiful sunny day. And I'd be like, oh, there's a bunch of people going to the beach. Uh, like tons of girls, people, someone's got beer ball. Like it's going to be sick. And they'd be like, uh, no, we're stay in the basement, practice a little bit. And I'd be like, you guys are fucking nuts. <laughs> but You're it like, was totally worth yeah. it. You know what I mean? That's, I mean. Between that, jamming in the basement, I mean, every time we'd ride around in John's mom's minivan, we were always, like, singing and practicing harmonies, like, because wow. it was fun, you know, not because we thought we had to, but because we enjoyed it. Yeah, you guys always did have really good harmonies, too. Like, yeah, was... those, th- those things those things really paid off. I mean, like, you know, tasty dividends, you know what I'm saying? But, like, it was just fun for us. We were just doing what we want, what we would be doing anyway, you know, but as it turns out, it's kind of like a mr miyagi style way of training yourself you're doing this wax on wax on stuff just singing harmonies to you know whatever song it is in the van and then when it's time to go on stage you, you guys can all kind of slip into your role and not you know step on everybody's feet in regards to like you know jumping on their harmony or that was a big thing for us we, we wanted to make sure that when we go out we, we we killed it we wanted everyone to be like that band was the best band tonight and even if we weren't <laughs> i remember back then the only bands I remember focusing on harmonies or when it was brought to my attention was uh, my buddy Josh from that band Humble Beginnings. He, yep, yep. Yeah, he would he would be practicing harmonies because he was like, yeah, No Effects does this. So exactly. We want yeah, to do no that. No Effects, uh, Bad Religion, you know what I mean? Like yeah, oohs and ahs and stuff, like three-part ooh and ah harmonies, like doubling up like doubling up stuff on choruses or pre-choruses. Like it just sounded so full and good yeah i took it to a next level too because you're like wait wow this band really is they really give a shit about what yeah i mean it's cool because like and i think too like that kind of alienated us from some of the more like gutter or crust punk dudes but i was like fucking i don't care man like 
you know, G.G. Allen's always going to be around for that shit if you want it. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, <laughs> we're going to try something else. You know, like we like we like doing this. How long into the career or Smack and Isaiah did, was it before you guys went on tour? Oh, geez. So we Smack and Isaiah formed in like 96. Um, we graduated high school in 97. Mm hmm. And uh, we were on tour that summer, down wow. to Florida and back. Florida was so, always yeah, the place. We, it was always the place yeah. to go. The east, the east coast run was like the big thing for us. So like we, uh, we got a little tiny U-Haul. We got John's mom's at little mini Astro van where the heater didn't work. Oh God. And uh, and uh, or the air conditioning didn't work. Actually, that's what it was. Yeah, the uh, summer. <laughs> and uh, and we. You know, we picked up and drove down to Florida and back, you know, playing a couple small shows here and there. Uh, and that was that was it. Like once we did that run, man, I was hooked. I was like, dude, this is so much fun. Did you guys decide, though? Did you guys have a conversation as a band that early and say, guys, like we should make a run for this and do it? Yeah, I think I think everyone. I mean, we were just finishing up high school. I mean, uh, Trevor, uh, Trevor, you know, knew that he was going to he wanted to attend UMass Dartmouth and, and get his degree in English. Uh, and so, you know, we'd have to work kind of around that. Plus everyone had jobs. I mean, I had, I moved out of the house as soon as I graduated. So like, I literally, I was like, you know, paying rent and bills and stuff like that. Like, you know, when I, while I was <laughs> balancing that an apartment and bills in a band all while making, you know, five thirty five an hour, yeah. uh, was, was pretty tough. But I mean, it's, I, I realized quick that like, you know, if, if you're willing to make the sacrifice, then you gotta, you know, you gotta take that, you got, you gotta take the ride. You know what I mean? Like, you can't just kind of be like, okay, yeah, I'm gonna give up, you know, warm meals and showers for a month and a half. You know what I mean? And like, but that's it. I'm only doing it for a month and a half and never again. You know what I mean? Like that, that thought process is is never there. You've already sacrificed so much. You kind of gotta see it through. You know? But it is taxing, man. People sometimes people can't hack it on the road. You know what I mean? I know John John Cavallo loved going on tour, but like he would be super stressed out about money and rent and all this stuff. Plus, he was trying to get his little record label, Tank Records, off the ground. Like it was it was it was tough, man. It wasn't easy, but uh, looking back on it, I'm like, I was super fun. <laughs> I was pretty impressed too because when we we would play in New Bedford, we'd always like play with you guys, and right. there was that one time where we all went on the beach and like we're burning uh christmas trees trees oh that was at john's mom's house yeah <laughs> that was so fun i've talked about that in one interview where we it was like i think it was when, when we came up with lwl yeah we yep. played and then we but i remember we ended up staying at your apartment and i was like how does this guy have a fucking apartment he's my age <laughs> i was yeah, like right. i can't afford shit <laughs> this guy's got his shit together we had a place to like where we can hang out and drink and all that stuff yeah it was tough i mean i I, I definitely, I mean, I didn't have a penny to my name. It all went to, it's, you know, cheap beer and rent at that point. You know what I mean? Yeah, which is perfect. Shows, we, we never got paid for shows. After, I think, our second or third tour, which was, like, again, like, a, like a three-week or a month-long tour, uh, John Tevs gave wow. me 50 bucks when he was dropping me off. And I just about pissed my pants. Like, I was so excited that I made 50 <laughs> bucks uh, touring, playing shows, every single day for, for like three and a half, four weeks, you know? That's a long ass. You guys went on three month long tours? Oh, no, no. We'd go like three weeks at a time. Then, oh, okay. I was like, or Jesus like a month Christ. at a time. But I think the longest stretch we did was probably like, yeah, during those like early Wilhelm scream days, like we would go out for two months at a time, no problem. Okay, so is, but did you guys tour us, Mac and Isaiah? We did. I think okay. we toured us, Mac and Isaiah like once or twice. Yeah, down in Florida was the one time. And then, mm -hmm, okay. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, how did you meet Russ, All About Records, Russ? Uh, Russ was a guy who was just in New Bedford, like, all, like, around, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, going to shows and stuff like that. Um, like, doing reflections, put on the shows there. Well, yeah, I mean, we, we, uh, he kind of took advantage of us, unfortunately. Um, we, <laughs> he was another one that never paid us. Like, we would pack that place out, like, once a month, right? Like, yeah. you know, sell, like, 200 tickets, like all these other bands did. And never, ever get paid. Oh, no shit. Like, oh, yeah, you know, we're saving money for the air conditioner. Like, air conditioner, man. It's been, like, at this point, like, you know, I've been hearing that story for, like, two years, man. Where's this <laughs> fucking air conditioner at, Russ? Like, you know what I mean? Uh, like, calling us up. Hey, man, we got a show. Can we borrow your PA? Because we, like, one of the only bands had, like, a, well, it was just a practice PA. You know uh -huh. what I mean? Like, two yeah. tens on sticks, essentially. You know what I mean? Yep. But, uh, 
you know, like, dude, we, we supplied the PA for some pretty kick-ass shows over there. <laughs> uh, hot couple hot water music shows. Oh, uh, shit. Yeah. Uh, but anywho, uh, we would, uh, we would like, you know, get in contact with Russ. Russ, Russ would, you know, take the time to book bands and kind of, you know, book the hall and, uh, and do all that fun stuff. And it was just, it was a perfect timing. You know what I mean? Like at that time, like indie music, punk and hardcore was really like popping. you know what I mean? Like it wasn't underground so much anymore. It was kind of in your face. And, uh, and it was, uh, it was really cool. The people over at reflections, I mean, reflections for those of people who are listening, don't know, it was like a, like a halfway house essentially. Yeah. Like it was a, it was a rehabilitation like, you know, uh, place, you know, where, you know, people were just, you know, maybe just getting out of the halfway houses or just getting back out of, you know, rehabilitation or drug treatment or jail for this shit. Uh, ambulance, uh, <laughs> you know, they, they could go and like, you know, sit down and have meetings or whatever, whatever. Uh, but those people, were, those people were really, really gracious, especially since you're allowing like a bunch of underage kids who are completely bombed from drinking in their cars or whatever, you know what I mean? Like yeah. into there, but I mean, the money was good for them. It helped them out. I'm sure. Uh, it certainly lined Russ's pockets, uh, for a while. <laughs> are you still friends with Russ? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. I see him every now and again. Uh, not as often as we would but i mean he's still doing stuff he's still popping in and out like he'll come by the restaurant and say what's up does he still have um is he still doing all about records i don't know to what like to what degree or what facet he's doing that um it would turn more into he had like a venue that he turned because we yes I, I played in like taunton before yeah yeah up in yeah, taunton right taunton. Mm-hmm. yep Yes, that's right. That's great. Like Russ, Russ loves music. Russ made a lot of connections, like, and he helped out so many people. You know what I mean? Like, but uh, I mean, if, I feel like if it wasn't Russ, it would have been somebody else. This area just has that kind of uh, drive. You know what I mean? Like, you know, that DIY kind of mentality. Because you know, in a, in a in a struggling city like New Bedford, like the city's not gonna fucking help you out. Like, they're yeah. not gonna. You know what I mean? Uh, club owners, bar owners, they don't give a fuck about music. They just want to sell booze. You know what I mean? Like they don't want, you know, they want cover bands. They don't want live, you know, you know, original punk bands playing in their in their establishment. You know what I mean? Like, so Rust, uh, Rust took the lead and kind of when he went out to Taunton and did his own thing, the all about records and the venue out there. I thought that was amazing. You know what I mean? I was like, fuck, man, why didn't you do that shit in New Bedford? Yeah, I remember playing that in like 2004 five or six i had started another band this is like right i got back to jersey and i was trying to get back into it i was just like ah this just doesn't feel the same and i was like well well," you know my buddies in the band they're like oh we want to tour or play at weekends everywhere i was like i don't want to do that shit but we ended up playing a show in taunton it was fun but uh i mean that you could you could see at that point too we i mean we'll jump back to like where you know uh the early 2000s but i mean you could see at that point where i what i saw was just it was just starting to just die or just go in a different yeah. direction it was like it a was. struggle. yeah you know you're competing with and at the time too like bands are kind of doing their own they don't depend they they're not as dependent you know my space was was a big thing for bands at that time i think mm-hmm. uh and an easy way to kind of make those connections and network and kind of do your thing uh you weren't as heavily dependent on local promoters or agents or something like that weren't you guys on like before we transition over to a wilhelm scream like wasn't smack and isaiah actually on all about records like technically the label or did you guys because i knew no, you guys no no we did we did tank records like we had our own label like, oh, okay so that was john's. john yep. that was john's thing and then once john left the band uh that's when we we had had a bunch of music recorded ready to go like um and uh so we just put out benefits of thinking out loud as smack and isaiah uh, between that and the next record, uh, John Cavallo quit the band. So we lost yeah. an original member and we had been working on a bunch of tunes. Uh, and we were like, you know, let's change the band name. Let's do it now. You know what I mean? Cause we were all in, you know what I mean? Like John leaving the band kind of made us all like kind of, you know, check ourselves like, all right, John's out anybody else <laughs> like you know what i mean kind of a thing like because yeah. it's 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 you know it's shit to get off the pot and so we did we were like yeah we're all in man like we fucking changed the band name we we polished up those tunes uh and that ended up being um mute print yep uh but uh in that interim i think we had licensed uh like way to a girl's heart you know to russ to put out to re-release 
So okay. we, that in in that regard, we were on all about records. But it was just as a like a like a distro deal kind of a thing. You know what I mean? Like he'll pay to reprint them or whatever and sell us X amount at whatever cost and mm-hmm. yada yada. But uh, we never like had like a label. Like we never signed with All About Records. You know. When Runer came out, you guys had the artwork designed by Rob Dobby. Yeah. And I was following him in 2004 because I went back to school to be a graphic designer and I, I stumbled mm-hmm, across mm-hmm. his stuff. And actually, his artwork, it led me to find all these bands like Circus Survive and. No and doubt. All this yeah. Shit. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Because I saw that and I was like, wait. And I checked that out. I was like, oh my God, I love this. And I saw that he did the artwork for you guys. I was like, holy Christ. I'm like, wait a minute. I was like, Wilhelm, Wilhelm Scream. And I, I was looking through like the line art. So I was like, wait. I was like, I fucking know those guys. Like, they were. Yeah, yeah. So I couldn't say it. I didn't change. But when I heard the sound, I was like, this is. Like, I don't know, I just felt like, did you find that when you changed the name to Wilhelm Scream that the sound kind of progressed, or did you think you kept the same sound all the way through? I mean, I felt like we were progressing just as, just as you know, young men learning to play better, you know what I mean? Or, you know, challenging ourselves to, uh, to you know, write songs that, that, were, that were hard to play. Really challenging ourselves to come up with really, you know, fun parts or cool uh, really dynamic, you know, kind of shit that, you know, essentially would be, would become like our sound, um, uh, doing that. Also, I would say like the amount of touring we were doing after that first record, that mute print record. I mean, we were on tour for probably eight months out of the year, you know what I mean? Touring on that record. Uh, and I'm here to tell you like nothing whoops a band's ass into shape, like playing, X amount of shows, you know what I mean? Like hundreds of shows a year. Oh yeah. Uh, that'll really, that'll really get you locked in. Um, once we did that, we were also kind of writing, uh, while, while touring, uh, sharing ideas, getting ready for the next record. Um, I really, I really give it up to Trev. He really made sure it kept us all kind of focused. You know what I mean? Like I want this real bad motherfuckers. And like, if you don't want it as bad as me, get the fuck out of my way. Kind of a thing. You know what I mean? Like, That's amazing. Uh, and it was awesome. Like I, I thrive on shit like that. You know what I mean? I thrive on someone being like, is that all you got? Like, you know what I mean? Like (laughs) what else can you, what else can you bring to the table kind of thing? I thrive on shit like that, you know, and Trevor's, Trevor's great at getting the best out of everybody. I will say this as well, like getting into the blasting room from you print and ruiner. Yeah. Like that was a game changer. Oh yeah. Huge. Like, I mean, we went from like, you know, Bill asking us if we were actually retarded to like, you know what I mean? Like <laughs> going in the next time, like ready. I mean, we recorded mute print in like seven days, dude. And like, we didn't have like a single song tracked on drums until like day three. You know what I mean? Like it was tough. <laughs> Wait, what was the video you guys did for mute print? It was, um, it was on a, I remember I saw it on a disc, like some kind of video comp. You guys are in oh, it, 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 a single shot and there's like papers flying all around and like lights yeah, are just flashing. Yeah, it was, uh, Famous friends and fashion drunks, maybe. Yeah, because I remember listening to that. We get like I, smashed with bottles and yes. stuff like that. And, yeah, and, yeah, and I, yeah. there was a part in that when I'm watching the video and it comes, I'm like, all right. And then you guys kick into the harmonies, and I'm like, whoa. And what label were you on at that point? Uh, that was Nitro Records. Oh, that's right, Nitro. Okay. We, yeah, we signed on to Nitro for uh, for three records, and uh, and um, you print, they were still like really like uh, when we first signed on, they were like a fully functioning, fully staffed operation, oh, yeah. you know, unfortunately, like the way the music industry went and the way, you know, like it went for them, they started scaling down and back and down and down. Unfortunately, they would. I mean, by the time we were, uh, you know, done fulfilling our contract, I mean, they were essentially like a catalog label. You know what I mean? They weren't really signing many new bands uh, at all. Uh, I think they were just kind of living off of like you know, the AFI residual kind of thing, you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. Like, I was going to say, wasn't it Dexter from, um, Offspring's yep, yep. level? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yep. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so many rad people working for him. Nitro Records was super fun, super fun people to work with over there. They really, they really did everything they could for us. Uh, for the most part. I mean, we never took any tour support or anything like that. We didn't like the idea of it. Plus I don't think it was ever offered. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, like, you know, uh, they put us in front of a lot of people and kind of gave us a little bit more, um, you know, clout in that regard. Like, oh, these guys signed to, like, you know, the label that put out AFI, the label that, you know, uh, put out, you know, Gutter Mouth. Like, you know, oh, yeah. so it kind of gave us some clout and it was pretty cool. Like, I mean, I, I still have that record contract. You know what I mean? Like, I still have it, like, you know, saved, you know. Um, did you, when you signed to them and, and started doing all that, did you feel. Like, did it feel different or did it feel like exactly 
what you wanted it to? Like, were you like, holy like, shit, I felt like we, I, I mean, not to sound like a prick, but I felt like it was what we deserved. You know what I mean? Um, I think a lot of labels, uh, we at that time, like I said, we were touring, you know, seven, eight months out of the year easily. You know what I mean? Like easily. And uh, so we were playing. We were in front of a lot of people playing with a lot of bands. And I, I kind of was like, oh, man, I wonder if, you know, I wonder if, you know, Fat Mike was at the show. I wonder if he's going to, like, come up and talk to us or like, oh, this guy from Bad Religion was at this show. I wonder if maybe we'll get a call from them or. But, you know, the phone call never <laughs> phone calls never came. And I was like, oh, well, whatever. Um, you know, I was like, maybe my hair is not right. Now I have no hair. Fuck, I totally missed it. Uh, but like, again, like we didn't we were never like, oh, it's going to happen. Like we're going to blow up. It was never that really. It was well, just what did like, you want? Like, what did you really want it to just be? I just be? wanted to stay on tour. I just wanted to stay on tour and write more music. Like, I just, that's all, like, I love being on tour. I love it. You know what I mean? Um, it's the funnest thing, going to live shows. I mean, even if I'm not the one playing, I still like going, you know what I mean, for the most part. Are you still going to shows uh, and watching bands play now? Yeah, I went, I went and saw Vale a couple weeks ago. Oh, that's okay. Sick. So good. Uh, I'll go check out local shows, you know, like all the time around here in New Bedford. Like, the scene now is is as strong as it's ever been so there's a ton of really cool bands i mean punk hardcore indie electronic surf rock fucking garage rock like there's so many cool bands and they're all they're all you know pretty hungry so they're all playing shows every week and 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 keeping like the new bedford scene like really 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 vibrant it's pretty awesome that's awesome yeah did you guys um i'm trying to think here um did you guys ever have any, like, so when, how long were you on Nitro just for the two records and then you were done? Three records, three, three record deal on Nitro. Yeah. So we did uh mute print, uh, ruiner and, uh, career suicide. suicide. Yeah. I mean, no, um, shit. Yeah. Maybe career suicide. Right. Yeah. It's cause that's, that's what I have in front of me. And then party crasher was 2013. That's right. Yeah. And that was the one we did ourselves. Um, okay. essentially, uh, and so, like, and now we're like, we already got like a ton of, ton of new songs and like, you know, like pretty well demoed out. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. and we're just excited that, you know, in this day and age, like from going like, oh man, I hope so-and-so gives us a call or I hope, you know, hope we can get a couple more records off of this guy or like, you know, this label or we can sell this to somebody and they can, you know, put us on the road. Like now it's like in our own hands and we're completely like, you know, the captains of our ship. You know what I'm saying? Like. I'm trying to figure out Spotify still because I'm a 40 year old dude who doesn't really do that shit. Yeah, but you guys, I mean, obviously you're on there. And now, but it, but being on there though, is that through you guys, or or is the is someone else running uploading your music for you? Uh, no, I'm pretty sure it's through us. I mean, okay. I'm not doing it because, uh, like, like I said, I'm 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 you know, I'm not really qualified to to be handling stuff like that. But um, I'd like to be at some point. I'd like to be at some point. You know what I mean? It's it's one that Trevor and I and Nick have been getting together like once a week to go over demo tracks and drum tracks and shit. And uh, Trevor's like, hey, man, check this out. Like, I found this link. It's basically, it's like a tutorial on how to make Spotify work for you. <laughs> so I'm like, ah, oh, shit, I got homework. Fuck. Uh, <laughs> no like, one's going to be homework, man. Yeah. No one's going to know. So there's going to be homework, man, shit. Um. <laughs> But, uh, but yeah, like it's, it's pretty ingenious and I, I, and it's exciting. You know what I mean? It's, it's fun to kind of be the captain of the ship in, in regards to like how our music is released. Yeah. Um, how much is, you know, how much, you know, you charge for it, who's in charge, you know what I mean? It's, it's kind of, it's, it's a lot, a lot more task heavy, but I mean, it's, it's 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 ours you know what i mean like it's it's, well, it's, not, it's awesome but now that nitros are gone gone or been gone like who i mean do you guys still like get royalties and stuff or like does anyone even yeah own yeah the yeah, yeah i got a i got a like a whopping 114 dollar check i think the, <laughs> the other day more than i ever got <laughs> oh it's pretty awesome i don't even know like they say they come in like quarterly i don't even know what that means bro like i don't know <laughs> I'm like wondering if there's more money flowing out there that I don't know about. You oh, know what shit, I mean? Like, man. Well, you got that ASCAP account. You guys have like an ASCAP, obviously. Yeah, right? ASCAP, yeah. BMI, all that stuff. That that's okay. pretty much how it gets handled. You know what I mean? Oh, that's right. How did you guys meet Rob Dobby? Real quick. Uh, did he reach out to question. you? Because I know he was a huge fan. Of he was guys. a fan, and yeah. uh, and then someone's like, dude, this guy. I think it was Trevor's. Like, yo, this dude's like fucking legit, dude. Like, check out his work, and he yeah. wants to work with us. And I was like, yo, hell yeah, dude. Um. And yeah, it was just, it was just like that, you know, like, I think that's the way it works with a lot of designers and stuff. Like, oh, I'm into this shit. I came up with a couple of designs. If you're into it, he knew that, you know, we had a budget for it as well. So like, you know, it, it, it was mutually, you know, beneficial. 
in that regard. You know what I mean? We got killer artwork. He got paid. We love working with Rob. Rob likes the band. Like it was a, it was a pretty, pretty good fit. You know what I mean? In, 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 in that regard, I don't know that it happens all the time like that. Yeah. Maybe in my, maybe in my head it does. But like, well, it kind of worked out for you guys too, because he had a popular following. Like he, he had a, true. Uh, he had full bleed when he had that. I still have a, a ton of full bleed shirts that I still wear. And so that's cool where you have someone actually design your stuff. It's, it's almost like, I mean, even it's like one, like recording the blasting room, that alone is going to get you recognition from people to check true. you out. Absolutely. Like, oh, Bill Absolutely. Doing this. And then this kid had like a ton of people following him. So through that, people then are finding you and then vice versa, which typically doesn't, I don't think really happens a lot with artwork unless you're like fucking Sergi from, um, uh, Sam, uh, Ed, who's done right, like, right. so much artwork for bands and still does it like to this day. That's, I was so jealous. Like I went, was going to school. I saw it. I was like, Oh my God, I want to be like this kid. I want to just do fucking artwork for bands. bands. And, yeah. Hell yeah. Oh, uh, I was like, fuck. Rob's a big hockey company. guy too. You know that? Oh, is he really? Rob's a big hockey guy. Yeah. I, I know. I followed him. It's like, he always talks about, like he used to talk about like wrestling all the time and, and all yeah. that shit. But, he designed a couple. He's designed a couple jerseys for like some beer league and like some men's league uh, teams out in New York and shit like that. That's amazing. That's yeah, so it's pretty cool. awesome. Yeah, I saw on your site um, that you guys, uh, yeah, like to get the fest and shit going on. Your website's fucking sick, by the way. Oh, is it? I mean, it's a lot coming from a designer. Oh yeah, I was like, wow, these guys have their shit together. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I mean, typically around this point, I'm usually like, oh, had the band break up, but like you guys, or how did you guys, <laughs> but you didn't. So it's like, but how did right. you guys slow down? Like what, what finally made you guys, or like, actually, no, what, when you guys transitioned in a, you know, I'll wrap this up with a couple questions, but when you transitioned from the late nineties and the early two thousands, like I always talk about how I saw such a giant difference and I jumped out of it, but there's a bunch of bands. Like I talked to Ben from Armor for Sleep and he transitioned with it and like you guys stayed with it even like today like you guys aren't torn all the time but you still will play fest and you have like a following like a original following that'll come up and see you guys like when you were transitioning in 2000 did you notice what was happening around you and like what were your thoughts on it i mean you could you could see like things were changing you know what i mean uh but ultimately i think it's on you whether or not i mean let put it to you this way um most of our fans that I've ever met and had interactions with, like most of them aren't like prototypical, like, you know, punk rock fans. Like, you know what I mean? Like, uh, and also like, I feel like they're a little bit more, they're not as flavor of the month type of people. You know what I mean? Cause okay. we're not a flavor of the month type of band. Yeah. Uh, like we, you have to listen to our songs a couple times. Like, you know what I mean? Like, so they did their due diligence and, and stuck around with us. And in regards to like the scene change, like we could see it, but I mean, our shows were still our shows. There was, it was changing, but not necessarily for us. I think maybe what it was doing was kind of calling some of the shit band overflow and making people more aware of like the substance that a band brings and not just like the look or the or whatever you know what i mean like the disco punk and the hair yeah flat I mean, iron like shit was going we on. went out and i mean to be honest like we went out and played these kids hometowns three or four or five times a year yeah i'm not talking like chicago i'm talking about like my not north dakota or wherever the hell you know what i mean like the middle of nowhere iowa we would go through your town three times, four times a year some and play your tiny town for you and your friends. Uh, that, I think, really endears people to the band. You know what I mean? The fact that we care about the kids who are out in the sticks because, you know, we're kind of the kids out in the sticks for, for a long time. Like, uh, we, we love going to your town and meeting your friends and partying with you and playing music with you and your friends' bands. Like, we never got sick of that. We never were like, we're, we're better than that. We never turned down those shows, you know? Um and then so in that regard, we 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 kind of like uh, built up like a really, really strong kind of grassroots following, a following that, for instance, isn't going to stop listening to you because, you know, uh, Nuno got balls, you know, what I mean? <laughs> or yeah. like uh, because you guys aren't doing enough, like Nick's not playing enough jazzy hi hat shit, you know what I mean? Disco beat shit, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> like we we endeared ourselves to them. Uh, by coming through all the time and coming through with a lot of energy and not being bummed out that we're playing, you know, D market towns, you know what I'm saying? Like that was, that was never, and we would give them the same show. You know what I mean? We'd give them the same show, whether it was like a 500 cap room sold out while we we're direct support or, you know, a tiny VFW hall 
you know, with 75 kids, like we're going to be in your face, super loud, super tight, lots of energy. Like, you know what I mean? That's just because that's what we like to do. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, uh, you know, like you look at bands like the Grateful Dead, right? Yep. They're never going to lose fans. No one ever goes like, I used to like the Grateful Dead. No one's ever said that, right? Yeah. Like if you're listening to the Grateful Dead and you like them, guess what? You like them for life. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, so, and I, I feel like a Willem scream kind of has that, that fall, that kind of a following too. Like no one's ever like, Oh, uh, I used to like them, but now they're like, it's like, nah, we're the same band. <laughs> you yeah. Know you guys like, definitely kept the same sound. We never catered to, you know, the, the flavor of the month kind of a thing. Like we, we don't put out records as often as we used to, obviously, you know what I'm saying? I think that's, that's, you know, difficult for, for some of our fans and for us as well. Yeah. But I mean, it's like but a lot of bands, like think of how many bands you love or you, you know, if you followed, um, and they, they put out a lot of releases. Sometimes you're kind of like, I don't know. There's a point where some certain bands I really loved. And I was about after three or four records, I was like, oh, okay. All right. And then they kept like putting more out. I'm like, I just, you know, sometimes I just really love the old stuff. It's rare when they're putting out the new stuff where I'm and going, you're hyped on it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm like, wow, they still, this is still, you know, catch me like the, the new face to face that came out recently. I don't know. It was in the last couple of years. That's actually really fucking good. And right. prior to that though, it was kind of like, okay, like, you know, these aren't really, it's like, they almost kind of, I don't know. They just revved up again with a few songs. I was like, shit, man, these guys wrote some cool songs now that almost has like a fresh feel to it. Right, so I think if right, you take right. some time in between records, like you guys are doing, then I think it does keep it. I don't know, more of a fresh sound than if it's like every year, another fucking record comes out. You're like, all right. I don't know. That's my opinion. <laughs> yeah, it's it's. I mean, you want to make sure you're, you're you're putting out quality tunes for sure, first and foremost. You know what I mean? You don't rush out every little idea. You know what I mean? But yeah, but yeah, I mean, like, too, like I look at bands like D4, and I think I read in an interview somewhere like they were like, yo, no one ever. You know, when we started playing punk rock, you know, there was never anyone telling you like, hey, by the way, one record every two years. You know, like there was no <laughs> rules to this shit. Like you just do it when you want to do it. Like you write some fucking tunes and you put them out. Like yeah, you know, you're not. We're not we're not contractually obligated to, to put out X amount of records and X amount of time, which has got to be nice. Yeah. I will say that it's, it's nice. I mean, it is good to have pressure like, Hey man, like mm, true. don't, don't just fall back and do nothing. You know what I mean? But you know, it's, it's, it's kind of nice that you can kind of sit back and, and refine your shit and, and do it at your own pace. You know what I mean? As an artist, I think, I think we're all entitled to do that. And the fact that you guys still are doing it too. I mean, that's, that's a yeah. huge thing. Like you're not being like, Oh, this, we have to do this because we have to do this tour. You're like, we have to do this because we get to do this. Exactly. Yeah. You know what I mean? And that's what it's always been about. It's always been about, we want to do it. It's never, it's never like, Oh, we owe it to somebody or we you do this or that. It's like we owe it to ourselves, you know what I mean? To write killer songs and have fun doing it because that's, that's what bands are supposed to be doing. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's and we're friends true. first too. You know what I'm saying? Like we kick it all the time without talking about music. You know what I mean? We'll just go out and have beers or go to someone's birthday party or, you know, do random shit like that. Go play basketball or whatever, you know? Do you guys still see the the two Johns like in? in yeah, the well, not John John Cavallo, not as much. He kind of like he kind of went off and did his own thing. Um, I think he's been doing pretty well for himself, to be honest with you. Um, I'm not on Facebook. I never have been. So like, I, it's I, certain people, you know, they keep in touch with with others that kind of move on through yeah. Facebook. I don't really have that advantage. Uh, John Tebbs, on the other hand, is still around. Like, I'm actually just looking at a piece of mail right now <laughs> from. Uh, Northwestern Mutual, my life insurance policy, okay. which John Tebbs helped me set up. <laughs> That's a basic. Hell yeah. Super adulting. Um, John is John has always been the most adult motherfucker in the band. Really? Since the since the jump. Yep. John's been John's been like the band. He was like the band dad. Yeah. Why did he leave back in uh, 2006? Uh, he he was um he was his life was shifting gears. He had been working super super hard to finish up to get his degree. He was like working pretty much a full time job. He was interning like 20 something hours a week uh, and he was going to school and he was doing the band. Jesus. Um, and uh, for him at one point, he's like, it's this is, you know, my my focus is shifting. I need to focus on, you know, establishing my career uh, as, you know, in, in like, you know, in business or whatever. Um and it was really kind of sad. I mean, him and him and Trevor were inseparable for, you know, the better part of, you know, 15 years, you know, formative years. Yeah. 
uh, as a writing partner, he was invaluable. Like, I mean, John Tebbs could sing, he could play, like he was, he was, you know, he was a solid dude. <laughs> it still is. But like in regards to like music, like he was just a super solid bass player, like a really great singer, like, and he was a, he was Trevor's main writing partner. You know, they've been best friends since they were kids, you know? So, uh, it affected, it affected us all differently, but I think, I think it really affected Trevor. Um, but he came out of it and was like, ah, fuck it. I, I can still do this. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah, I'm like, I'm still coming up with a ton of ideas. Like it's going to be a little tough not to have one of our best friends around every day, but you know, and that's when we discovered that you can go out and get a better bass player. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I am going to say, like, I, I just remember hearing the first record when you guys got Brian, and I'm like, yeah. what the, f- how many fucking hands does this right. guy have on the I neck? I know, right? Holy Dude. shit. And we've applied, like, then we were like, oh, we need a new guitar player. Like, let's get someone better. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, we can do that. That's a thing. It's allowed. Um I think, and I'm pretty sure Bill Stevenson kind of put us onto that kind of thing. He's like, hell yeah, dude. Just like, he, cause he, Bill Stevenson loved John Tebbs. Love. Yeah. Him. I mean, to know John is to love John, right? Yeah. But uh, he was like, oh yeah, man, you guys, you guys went and upgraded. <laughs> I'm like, hell yeah, dog. <laughs> Did you ever say that to John? Is he like, fuck you guys? <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, if he was standing right in front of me, I'd still be saying the same thing. You know what I'm saying? Like, he can take it. He gets it. But he came up, we did a mute print anniversary show like six months ago or something like that. Yeah. And uh, he came up and played like a couple of jams with us. He still got it, dude. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, he can still wail. He still got it. It's cool. I mean, you guys stayed friends. That's that's impressive. I've, I, some bands they just really lost touch, but you guys are like, yeah, man, we're still hanging out here and there. We can. We're and... small. We're small town guys, dude. Like yeah. when you go through war with somebody for years and years and years, you just that bond is is unbreakable. You know what I mean? Like that's awesome. Unbreakable. I mean, sure. Like me and Nick will yell at each other. Me and Trevor will get into like heated non-verbal arguments that make everyone uncomfortable <laughs> you know what i mean like but that's 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 part and parcel you know what i mean we've always got each other's back but you know this this shit can be really stressful people make sacrifices and yeah and sometimes that's that's a tough uh, you know it's a bitter pill to swallow but at the end of the day dude we're on stage having the fucking time of our lives like you know what i mean like playing our own songs like meeting new people seeing old friends all the time like it's it's just it's just a, a very we're very lucky you know what i mean in that regard yeah it looks like it too from like the photos or videos that i've seen of you guys playing where it's like you guys still look like you have a blast uh, people always ask me like dude how can you be smiling the whole time like this song's pretty pissed i'm like yeah that's why it's it's like it's cathartic like yeah, I'm getting I'm it out stoked. i'm getting this out and i'm happy about it you know what i'm saying like yeah Maybe it's the wrong thing to say. This the shit doesn't last forever, but I mean, yeah. it lasts as long as you want it to, and as long as it's worth maintaining. You know what I mean? What would you say and before I wrap this up? What was like the biggest show you guys played, like back in? I don't know. It could be more recent. Like in the in the last in the whole existence of Wilhelm Scream, where you guys played it and you're getting on stage or you're whatever you looked around, you're like, I can't believe this is happening right now. Oh, there's been a couple of those, like those, those Euro festivals sometimes, even, even now. But I mean, I remember playing like, uh, there's a festival called Gros Rock, Gros Rock okay. in Belgium. And, uh, I remember getting there, uh, you know, loading in early, early. It's like this huge field. They're like, oh, you're on like the main stage. And I'm like, oh, holy smokes. Like that's, that's, it's huge. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, and I'm like, we're the, you're they're like, you're the first band. And I'm like, oh, fuck. Like, we're going to be playing to, like, 75 kids in a tent that holds, like, 6,000. <laughs> and I was like, oh, man, this sucks. This sucks. And, uh, dude, we got there. I think we were on at, like, we were first band on. We were probably on at, like, maybe 1, one o'clock in the afternoon. Maybe. Maybe even, like, 1230. And I'm like, dude, there's no way these Euro campers are going to be, like, they're all hungover and shitty in their tents. Like, there's no way we're going to have a crowd. Dude, by the time we walked out on stage for the first song, I think there was like a little over 5,000 people looking at us. Oh, my God. And I was like, oh, shit. Here we fucking go, baby. Like, <laughs> here we fucking go. This is it. Dude, I don't I don't think my feet were on the stage longer than three seconds at a time. Like, I was jumping off of everything, sprinting up and down, jumping into the crowd. Fucking, uh, it was bananas, dude. Wow. Like, I got off stage. I remember looking like after like two songs in, looking at the side stage, and it's like, 
hey, there's the dude from fucking Bad Religion. Oh, there's fucking, you know, like this guy from this band that you love. Like, wow. And they're all like watching us like intently. You know what I mean? Jesus Christ. And I was all, yeah, this is the fucking best. Pickles, get in the house. Come on. Get Pickles. That's okay. What kind, of, what kind of dog is that? It's a French bulldog. Okay. Pickles. That's great. Pickles. My little old lady. <laughs> Um, but yeah, like that was bananas, dude. Then another time in, in, we had a similar experience in Spain playing a festival where it was like, dude, look at all these fucking people. Are you kidding me right now? Like, this is what it feels like to be fucking, you know, Bruce Springsteen. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like this must be it, but he does it every night and we get it like, you know, once a year. Yeah. But, but uh, you get to, you get to fucking have dog, it. It's the best feeling. Cause like. I mean, we're, we come from tiny clubs. We're built for, you know, in your face kind of, yeah. you know, that kind of a vibe, you know, but boy, do I get a fucking, I get so excited when we play huge shows like that, you know? That's amazing. Yeah. I'm sure when you guys play fest too, it's just like fucking insanity. It might not oh, be like yeah, 10,000 like people, but it's just 15 packed. stage dives a second, people <laughs> screaming, like I'm getting hit in the face with a mic, like. <laughs> Ah, uh, dude, blow my knee out, break my tooth, like, oh, oh it's God. the best, dude. It's the fucking best. God, you do love hockey. <laughs> <laughs> I really do. I was actually uh, just in my shed putting uh, putting some of my gear away. It's so fucking gross in there. Ew, yeah, that's got to smell fucking awful. <laughs> it's it's really one Especially... of the worst smells in the world. <laughs> Jesus. And you can't wash it out. You can't wash it out. It's 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 Ew. there for life. God, that'd be a product. That'd be figure that out. You could sell it to hockey players. Like, here's how to make. Oh, your... people sell products. Like, oh, this oh, okay. will take the stink out. Nope. Nope. <laughs> this will take out the death. They're like, no. 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 Nope. Do that. <laughs> All right, man. Well, I'll wrap this up uh, with two more questions. And um, so, one before I ask the last one, what do you want to plug? Oh, what do I want to plug? Yeah. Ooh. It could be about you. It could be about someone oh, that sure. you know. Uh, can... Oh well, we've got. Well, I think I mentioned it briefly. We've got a couple, a uh, couple shows coming up here in, in New Bedford in our hometown. Uh, we're getting a bunch of bands like from like the Reflections days back together to oh, do nice. some like to do some fun like hometown throwdown kind of a vibe. Oh, that's cool. Uh, so that's going to be a blast. Um, we have a little secret one that we haven't really announced anything about yet, but uh, okay. there's some secret stuff in the works. You know what I mean? All right. Um, what else? What else? Ah, geez, I don't know. You kind of put me on the spot there. I don't usually, I don't really do this. An hour uh, and 15 minutes later of asking you personal questions, I put you on the spot. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I wasn't thinking about this stuff. Uh, yeah, I mean, the new record's going to be coming out. Like, we'll be we'll be recording uh, over the winter. So, uh, like, and, like, I've already, I mean, I hate to be that guy, but, like, every fucking song is an absolute fucking banger, dude. Like, they're all super super good nice <laughs> so uh and i would be honest if one was like kind of shitty i'd be like oh there's like one shitty song in there but like, the rest of them are good now they're all super good uh so i'm excited about that uh, is it gonna be on vinyl or just digital i think we're gonna do digital and vinyl um nice uh one of the cool things now of course is like vinyl made a big comeback and yeah i think it's a fun fun way to put out you know new stuff it gives you i mean you as a designer must know it gives you like you know a little bit more you know, room to work with, so to speak. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, we love, I mean, artwork has always been a huge, huge part of like what we do as well. Like we, we take a lot of pride in, in who we choose to do these drawings or, or, you, you know, design these t-shirts or records for us. So hmm. that's really exciting um, that we get uh, another shot at doing some killer artwork. You know what I mean? Like for this record. Yeah, we did an etching. We did an etching on the back of ours. It doesn't. Oh, it doesn't, it doesn't play, but you. Yeah, we yeah. have like a, a quote from one of our songs, and I think that I haven't seen a lot of bands do that. I'm like, man. I mean, it does take up the real estate of that side of yeah. the record. So you have to fit. You have to have it basically an EP to like fit on the front side. But it's like I was like, that's so cool. I had a I had a bad religion etch like a seven inch. It was a uh, fuck Armageddon. This is hell <laughs> single. And on the bat, it was like, so the cover's like this big, like, bomb going off in cars all over the place, like this kind of drawing, you know? And it's completely etched on one side of the seven inch. It's unbelievable. I sold it for rent money. Uh, (laughs) Back in like 2003 or some shit. Uh, But yeah, uh, I'd like to get that record back. So if anyone out there has one of those, holler at your boy. Uh, I am Nuno on uh, Instagram. but anyway, uh, yeah. Also, yeah. Check out the band's Instagram, the Wilhelm Scream official uh, Instagram. We're constantly putting stuff out and kind of keeping the hype up. You know what I mean? Uh, through those channels and Facebook, maybe I don't know. I'm not on Facebook. 
Uh, yeah, I'm checking it out. Yeah, I guess that's it. And uh, go Bruins. Yeah, that, that and go Bruins. Go Bruins. And go, go Bruins. And go Pats, too. I see you're uh, Yeah, uh, the Pats don't, Pats don't need any help. Man. I know. You just watch them do their thing, man. Uh, yeah, my family's from, uh, just real quick, my family's from Massachusetts. They're from Lynn. And so I grew up my oh, dad. Yeah, yeah. So I grew up with like, my house. My dad was always a Pats and Red Sox fan. So I was like, oh. So yeah, I, oh, like, Lynn's, Lynn's a tough town. You know that? Oh, dude, Lynn's still a fucking tough town. It's, well, it's, like, Lynn's it's, tough as fuck, man. Yeah, dude, I wouldn't go to Lynn. Dude. <laughs> yeah, I think people in Lynn don't want to go no to Lynn. Joke. <laughs> nah, Lynn's tough as fuck, man. And yeah. I'm from New Bedford, man. The, like the like secret city, Crow City. Like this place is this place is tough as fuck. But man, Lynn is no joke. Yeah, and like it's funny too because my dad was not like a super hardened dude. He was like the nicest guy, and uh, yeah, so he never cut that. And my my family lives in Linfield, <laughs> so I mean they never had like that edge, that Lynn edge, I guess. Yeah. Of living. Oh boy, they were never addicted. They were never, never addicted to oxycontin and Dunkin' Donuts. Either. Oh yeah, <laughs> I mean everyone's addicted to <laughs> fucking dunks up there. I mean that's like a oh. fucking thing. <laughs> Um, donkeys bro I gotta go to donkeys did you see that that casey affleck skit on Saturday yes. live okay oh my gosh it's a fucking Dude, absolutely nailed it brilliant yeah brilliant it's so genius um yeah. <laughs> yeah but uh yeah i grew up being a Sox and pats fan so it's like i saw them nice. when they were shit and another the great it goes so great i'm like yeah no they did not used to be like this at yeah all. So no it's, it's just like i mean i'm a huge baseball guy like always have been uh, you know, hate the Yankees, you know what I mean? But I'm old enough to remember, too, that the Yankees were fucking dog shit for, like, uh, 10 years of my adolescence, you know what I mean? Like, they were fucking terrible. Was it, like, the 80s? Um, or it was, like, the... Um, Hen- yeah, the 80s, early 90s, dude. The Yankees were fucking dog shit, dude. The Mets were better than they were. Perennial, yeah. The Mets were the Mets were way better than them. The Mets were, like, uh, a fucking Yan- rock and roll team in the 80s. Like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Letty Dykstra uh, and like they're all on yeah. coke and shit and strawberry. They're yeah. all fucked up. Yeah, yeah. it's great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, it's fantastic. yeah, like so like and now like you know people are like oh the Patriots rah, 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 rah. I'm like hey man you know I get it now I get what like all the Yankees fans were hooting and hollering about you know what I mean like yeah, yeah. our team is you know the best but I mean we were you know bottom of the barrel for so many years and the Patriots were just like that the Patriots were dog shit for oh, like yeah. almost my entire life up until two thousand what three or whatever you know yeah. Yeah, so, anyway. All right, as so a last question, what scene ethics do you still hold on to to this day? Oh, uh, I'll say uh, I kind of I kind of referenced it earlier, 550 or 5000, it doesn't matter how many kids are there, they're there to see you. Uh, give them the best show you can, you know what I mean? Leave them wanting more, make them go, "Hey, these kids, this band came through my town. There was like me and nine friends and they put on a show that, you know, would rival like Kiss." You know what I'm saying? Like I I apply that you know, because not every show is going to be a banger. You know what I mean? Not every show is going to be kids crawling all over you and singing the songs back at you. Like, that's that's nice, and it will happen from time to time, but it's not happening every night. So so deal with it and get and, 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 and make sure that the next time you go through that little town that the kids are jumping all over the stage, are singing all your songs. You know what I mean? Like, get, give it all you can every single night because it's it's what the kids paid for. It's what you signed up for, you know? So yeah. there you go. And also keep your hands to yourselves. <laughs> keep your hands to yourselves. Don't be starting fights at that shows. Don't be fucking grabbing girls and doing all that fucking buffoonery. Leave that shit alone. Leave that shit way out of the scene. <laughs> like <laughs> I think it's good that people have been a lot more vocal about that in the last couple of years. But I mean, it's for real. Like it's it's disgusting and it, there's no place for it. So, yeah, give them all you got. Keep your fucking hands to yourself. <laughs>